Welcome back to The Late Show, already in progress, I hope. Folks, my next guest tonight is the chief White House correspondent for ABC News, president of the White House Correspondents Association, and he has a brand new book called Front Row at the Trump Show. Please welcome ABC's Jonathan Carl. Hey, Jonathan, thanks for being here. <laughs> great to be here. I uh, never thought the Ed Sullivan Theater was gonna be like this, but uh, it's great yes. to be here. Be the Beatles <laughs> played right up here. Excellent. The Beatles played right up there. And uh, I think Elvis Presley was in one of these pigeonholes right here. Fantastic. Right there. Um, where are we catching you? You at home? I am at home. This is the home office. You know, we're all working from home as much as we possibly can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, except for when I have to go into the White House. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for putting all of your Emmys in frame behind you. <laughs> yeah. Very, yeah. Very subtly done. I, I just picked them up. Um, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. I would have put mine up, but we don't have enough room in here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, uh, my understanding is that there's a member of the White House Correspondents Association who actually has tested positive for the coronavirus. Um, is that true and, and how is he or she doing? Yeah, we found out that one of our colleagues uh, not tested positive, Stephen, we actually don't have test results yet, but uh, came down with symptoms, is a suspected case of, of coronavirus, uh, uh, came down with this over a week ago, actually got tested eight days ago, and as of, uh, as of late yesterday, still had not gotten any test results back. So we don't know for sure, but all other tests have come back negative and it sure seems like our colleague has coronavirus. Well, that seems really surprising that you can't get a quicker test result for someone who is not only in an essential service, which is informing the public about what's going on, but also is in close proximity to the president, the vice president, and members of the cabinet. What, do you happen to know what the holdup is? Uh, it's, it's really unbelievable and, and I've been trying, I've been asking, every single day about this. Obviously, it's of intense interest uh, to every, everybody who is there. I mean, you mentioned uh, the public officials, but also all of us in the briefing room, all of us who work at, at the White House, this is somebody that, that, that we work in close proximity to, and we uh, cannot get an answer. Uh, it, it took a while to get the test, um, and I, I have no real explanation for why, but I'll tell you, it is a little maddening to hear uh, in those briefings a lot of self-congratulations about how great the testing is going now uh, when we know that one of our own colleagues is waiting now over a week to get test results. Um, these afternoon press availabilities that the president and the coronavirus team are doing, as the president himself has said, have had incredible ratings, people are, are tuning in, but there's also been a question about whether it's responsible to broadcast or to report on these coronavirus press availabilities because so much inf misinformation is being given by the president. What do you think the purposes of these meetings are? Well, I, I think that's a legitimate debate. I think there are two questions. One, should we cover them? Should we be there? Should we be reporting on it? I think the answer there is easy. Absolutely, it's our responsibility to go there, ask questions of the president, ask questions of the, of the people that are leading this effort for the federal government. But whether or not they should be carried live and unfiltered, I think is a legitimate debate. What, what we have tried to do is uh, to, to provide the context. And I, I just the other day, you know, the president uh, uh, said a number of things that actually were not true. And, uh, you know, I came on with my colleague, George Stephanopoulos, right after, and we went through a series of, now, wait a minute, no, that's not true, that's not true. But there is important information you get from them. I mean, that, that's our chance to talk to Anthony Fauci. That's our talk, chance to talk to Vice President Pence, who is actually leading the effort, uh, Dr. Burks. Uh, sometimes you have... Uh, you know, the Treasury Secretary has been in there several times about the economic effects. So it's an important thing for us to be covering. Whether or not it should be carried live and unfiltered, I think is actually a legitimate debate. One of the challenges of covering the president is not just the misinformation that might come out in one of these press availabilities, but also he wants to make it about himself when we might lose sight of the actual information we should be learning. It becomes very emotional and personal for him. For instance, last Friday, you, you pressed him on the availability of ventilators, I believe. And uh, he said, uh, don't be a cutie pie. Do I, am I reporting that accurately? Uh, you are. Uh, it, okay. was, it, was, it was truly the strangest moment that I've experienced with a president at a press conference. Because mm -hmm. my, my question, my exact question, you know, this is after Governor Cuomo said that New York was going to need, New York alone was going to need 30 to 40,000 ventilators in the coming weeks. Uh, and they were only getting a matter of a few thousand from the federal government. 
And I asked him, and he was talking about how all these efforts they were doing to, to, to get more ventilators into production, to force GM to do it, all of that. And, and my question was simply, can you assure us that the governors and the hospitals will be able to get enough ventilators so that everybody that needs one will have one? And I thought that was the central question, not, not, not a, you know, this was not, and, and he, he did not like to be held accountable for it. And that's when he said, don't be a cutie pie. I've never, mm. I, don't, I don't even know exactly what that means. He also t- told me in the same sentence that I was being a wise guy. So, mm. I, you know, I don't know, but it was weird. Jonathan, do you think you bear any responsibility for being a cutie pie? <laughs> because you are objectively a cutie pie. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I don't think no, so. No, I remember it's, you from when you were the, one of the young guns at CNN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, this has not been my aspiration. No, no. Okay. <laughs> well, you have a new book. Um, do you have a copy of it? Because I don't have oh, a copy of it here. Do you have- I, I, I actually do. Funny thing right here. There you go. Front, Front row, row the- at the Trump show about your uh, four years covering Trump so far. Is that what it is? Uh, it's actually 26 years, uh, Stephen. 26 oh, years. Oh, that's right. Because you were actually a reporter in New York for the New York yes, Post. Yes, yes. So was there, is there anything that Trump has done um, as president that surprised you based upon your knowledge of both his behavior and his character from all the years you covered him in New York? He's incredibly erratic. He's, incl- he's incredibly unpredictable. He governs by gut, just like he, just like he acted as, as, a, as a real estate developer. But actually, I think he has been ultimately entirely predictable in that unpredictability. But there is there was one moment that was really surprising to me. I, I happened to be in the Oval Office the day that he met, the day that he met Barack Obama for the first time. Uh, he, he was, this was two days after the election in 2016. And if you remember, it was a meeting that was supposed to be like 20 minutes and they ended up meeting for more than an hour. No, I, I remember. In, I went in with a, uh, with, with, a, with a small group of reporters, the, 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 what we call the press poll, into the Oval Office at the end of that meeting and I, I still have these, these pictures, and I took some video on my, own, on my phone as I was coming in. And Trump, for the first time, actually seemed humbled to me. And a little bit, you know, I, I got the impression, first of all, I never thought he thought he was going to win that election. And here he was in the Oval Office for the first time with Barack Obama, hearing about all the pressing issues he was going to inherit and have to deal with. And, and Obama was leading the meeting. I've never been in a room where, he wasn't, where, where Donald Trump wasn't leading the, the conversation. And he seemed a little bit blown away. He said some nice things about Obama, which was also surprising. Um, and I thought, wow, maybe this changed the guy. And that was the last I saw of it. Uh, I, I know we've got to go. Um, what's your first question for tomorrow's briefing? Well, there's, there have been some uh, reports that the CDC is considering recommending that people wear face masks when they go out in public. And I want to, get, I, I, I want to see if that's true, if there's anything to that. And and if that would really be a recommendation, where the hell all the, I mean, where the face masks would come from? Um, so that's, you know, I, I try to, in the briefings, try to focus on what is happening now, much less the, the politics of it. People want to know what the federal government is doing, what the federal government should be doing, and what they should be doing in the face of this crisis. Well, uh, thanks so much for being here, Jonathan. And congratulations, the book's number one on Amazon right now. Thank you. I, I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I, I really loved writing it. Hi. <laughs> I, I really have enjoyed reading your title when you held up the book in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, this is the book, in case you were wondering. There it is. Okay. There it is. <laughs> front row for the Trump show. Jonathan Carl, everybody. Uh, when we come back, we'll be giving a little message to our dear friend, John Prine.